Many are saying that we're in a bubble. Stocks, real estate, bonds, and crypto. Are we really? Well, it helps to know exactly what a bubble is before attempting to answer that question. And one of the best ways to do that is to examine some of the biggest and most destructive bubbles in history. That's exactly what I'm going to do in this video. This one, folks, you won't want to miss. Before we proceed, there's a disclaimer you must heed. I'm going to be telling you many things today, but none of it should be even remotely construed as financial or investment advice, okay? I prefer to stay in the lane of education, which will help you out of being a wage slave. If this is your first encounter with the Bureau, my name is Guy and I'm a crypto hero. I put the highest quality content on this site, counter to the FUD and clickbait hype. News, reviews, market moves, and much, much more. It all comes jam-packed with entertainment so you won't get bored. If you want to join me in my crypto fight, subscribe to the channel and ping that notification bell that shows up on the right. All right, that's my two pence. Let's take a look at bubbles that turn dollars into cents. The first asset bubble on my list is the Dutch tulip mania. This infamous episode was one of the most famous market bubbles of all time. It unfolded in Holland during the early to mid 1600s when speculation drove the value of tulip bulbs to some never before seen extremes. At the height of the market, the rarest tulip bulbs were trading for as much as six times the value of the average person's annual salary. Insane, I know. Now, tulips first appeared in Western Europe in the 16th century, arriving via the spice trading routes, which further fueled the speculative sentiment surrounding them. This is because tulips looked unlike any type of flower that existed in Europe at the time. So, it's no surprise that tulips became a luxury ornament destined for the gardens of the affluent and upper classes. According to the Library of Economics and Liberty, it was even considered in Western Europe as, quote, proof of bad taste in any man of fortune to be without a collection of tulips. Quite so. Accordingly, the Dutch mercantile middle class in the early 1600s sought to emulate their wealthy European neighbours, and they too began demanding tulips. Initially, tulips were a status symbol purchased by high society individuals solely because they were an expensive asset to have, a flex factor of sorts. But at the same time, tulips were renowned for being particularly fragile, and they required a substantial amount of gardening and cultivation expertise to preserve them. But the Dutch rapidly learned that tulips could grow from seeds or bulbs that grew on the mother bulb. A bulb which grew from a seed would reportedly take between 7 and 12 years to flower. But a bulb itself could flower the very next year. These so-called broken bulbs were a type of tulip that displayed a multicolored pattern rather than a single monochrome one. This variation in color and pattern was the catalyst which caused the growing demand for rare broken bulb tulips, which is what really led to their high market price. As always, it was good old economic principles at work. Low supply and high demand led to higher prices. It's only natural, right? Now, it's still pretty complex to accurately determine how overvalued these broken bulb tulips actually were in dollar terms. But according to historians, a single bulb could be worth as much as four or even five and a half thousand florins, which were the gold coins used as currency at the time. Estimates have unanimously placed some of the best tulips at a draw-dropping value of $750,000 in today's money. But the great majority of these would have traded between fifty dollars and $150,000. Still, that's absolutely insane for what is effectively a flower. By 1636, the tulip trade was so large that regular markets for their sale were established on the Stock Exchange of Amsterdam, in Rotterdam, Harlem, and elsewhere. And it was at that time that professional traders called stock jobbers got in on the action. It seemed as if everyone was making insane amounts of money simply by owning some of these rare tulip bulbs. In fact, it also seemed as if the price could only go up and that the passion for tulips would never wane. People even began buying tulips with leverage, using margin derivatives contracts to buy more tulips than they could afford. 
So, leverage has been one of the key exacerbating factors in these bubbles throughout history. And speaking of which, if you'd like to find out how one man was able to lose $20 billion in two days thanks to leverage, my video on Archegos is a must watch. I'll leave a link to it in the description. OK, back to tulips. As quickly as it sprouted, confidence in the tulip market soon faded. And by the end of 1637, prices began to fall and never looked back. A large part of the price decline was driven by the fact that investors had purchased bulbs on credit, hoping to repay their loans when they sold their flowers for a profit. But once prices started to decline, holders were forced to liquidate, meaning they were forced to sell their flowers at any price and to declare bankruptcy in the process. By 1638, ladies and gentlemen, the bubble had burst and bulb prices returned to their initial valuations. And while this asset bubble was not a devastating occurrence for the Dutch economy, it did undermine social expectations. The event destroyed relationships built on trust and the people's willingness and ability to pay. Anyhow, that's tulips. Second on our list is the South Sea bubble. This was the speculation mania that ruined many British investors in 1720. Now, this bubble was centred around the expected fortunes of the South Sea Company, a company established in 1711 to trade, mainly in slaves, with Spanish America. It was built on the assumption that the War of the Spanish Succession, which was then drawing to a close, would end with a treaty enabling and opening up such trade routes to the West. The company's stock, which offered a guaranteed interest rate of 6% per annum, sold pretty well. But the peace treaty in question, aka the Treaty of Utrecht, made with Spain in 1713, turned out to be less favourable than expected, as it imposed an annual tax on imported slaves and allowed the South Sea Company to send only one ship per year for general trade. The success of the first voyage in 1717 was pretty moderate. But when King George I of Great Britain became governor of the company in 1718, confidence grew exponentially in the enterprise, which was soon paying interest of up to 100% per year. In 1720, the company made a proposal to take over the national debt. This was approved by Parliament and it resulted in a massive boom in South Sea Company stock. Stocks rose from a price of £128 in January of 1720 to more than £1,000 in August. But by September of 1720, the market had collapsed and by December, South Sea shares were down to £124, dragging other stocks down with them. Many investors were ruined and the House of Commons ordered an inquiry which showed that at least three ministers had accepted bribes and speculated in the company themselves. The company's directors were disgraced as a result of the scandal. The South Sea bubble is commonly considered to be one of the largest asset bubbles to hit the British financial markets. And boy oh boy, what a burst that was. OK, next bubble and this one was double the trouble. The Japanese asset price bubble was an economic bubble in Japan from 1986 to 1991, which saw real estate and stock market prices greatly inflated. The bubble was characterised by a rapid acceleration of asset prices and overheated economic activity, as well as an uncontrolled money supply and credit expansion. More specifically, overconfidence and speculation regarding asset and stock market prices were closely associated with the excessive easing of monetary policy that was going on at the time. Sound familiar? And through the creation of economic policies that cultivated the marketability of assets, eased access to credit and encouraged speculation, the Japanese government started, prolonged and exacerbated the bubble. Now I will say that differing opinions exist regarding the Japanese asset bubble and what actually caused it. Earlier analysts found that the rapid increase in Japan's asset prices was largely due to the delayed actions by the Bank of Japan to address the issue. In fact, at the end of August 1987, the BOJ signalled the possibility of tightening monetary policy. However, it instead decided to delay the decision in view of the economic uncertainty linked to the infamous Black Monday of 1987 in the United States. Later research instead argued that the BOJ's reluctance to tighten the monetary policy was actually in spite of the fact that the economy went into expansion in the second half of 1987. 
This is because the Japanese economy had just recovered from the Endaka recession, which in Japanese translates to, quote, recession caused by appreciation of Japanese yen, which occurred between 1985 and 1986. The Endaka recession had arguably been linked to the Plaza Accord of September 1985. This was a joint agreement signed between France, West Germany, Japan, the UK and the US to strategically depreciate the value of the dollar against the French franc, the German mark, and yep, you guessed it, the Japanese yen. Anyway, despite there being some diverging opinions as to the main causes of the bubble, let me now tell you all about the crazy valuations that it brought about. Now, for definition purposes, the Japanese Real Estate Institute has classified Tokyo, Yokohama, Nagoya, Kyoto, Osaka, and Kobe as the six major cities that were most impacted by the price bubble. These cities experienced far greater asset price inflation compared with any other urban land nationwide. And by 1991, commercial land prices rose 302.9% compared with 1985, while residential land and industrial land prices jumped 180.5% and 162% respectively. Nationwide, statistics showed that commercial land, residential land and industrial land prices were up by 80.9, 51.1 and 51.7% respectively. These are some wild numbers, folks. By the early 1980s, Tokyo was an important commercial hub due to its high concentration of international financial corporations and offices. As was to be expected, the demand for office space continued to soar as more economic activity flooded Tokyo's commercial districts, resulting in demand outstripping supply. As a result, land prices in Tokyo's commercial districts increased sharply within a year. The average price for one square meter of land in Tokyo's commercial districts, for instance, in 1984 was around 1.3 million yen, or about $5,600 at the time. In just a year, this value increased to almost $8,000, with land in the most elite areas of Tokyo skyrocketing to a whopping $218,000 per square meter. But by 1990 and 1991, most urban land had already reached its peak price, and the bubble popped in 1992. Now, this next one you might be a bit more familiar with, the infamous dot-com bubble. Now, the dot-com bubble was a rapid rise in US technology stock valuations fueled by investments in internet-based companies during the bull market of the late 1990s. The value of tech stocks grew exponentially during this period, with the tech-dominated NASDAQ index rising from under 1,000 to over 5,000 between 1995 and 2000. Technically, the dot-com bubble grew out of a combination of the presence of speculative and fad-based investing and the abundance of VC funding for startups, all in companies that failed to turn a profit. During the 1990s, investors poured money into internet startups in the hopes that one day they would be able to exit their positions and turn a handsome profit. And many venture capitalists abandoned a cautious approach out of fear of missing out on the growth of the World Wide Web. Capital markets and institutions threw money at the sector. Startups were in a race to grow as quickly as possible. Fortunes were spent on marketing to establish brands that would allow them to compete with or even trounce the competition. Some startups reportedly even spent up to 90% of their budgets on marketing and advertising. So, let's get a bit of context and background to this insanity. The 1990s are typically considered to be a period of rapid technological advancement in many different sectors. But it was the commercialization of the internet that led to the greatest expansion of capital growth and VC FOMO. While high-tech established companies such as Intel, Cisco and Oracle were driving organic and sustained growth for the technology industry, it was actually upstart tech and dot-com companies that fueled the stock market surge starting in 1995. And the bubble that formed soon after was one that devoured all the cheap or dumb money, the easy capital, market overconfidence, hype, and high speculation. VCs became anxious to find the next big winning investment by allocating capital to any company with a dot-com after its name. It seemed like everyone had caught the dot-com bug, and traditional fundamental analysis principles were completely disregarded. 
But what's most surprising about this bubble is that these upstart tech companies were actually yet to produce solid revenue streams and profits, and in some cases they didn't even have a finished product to offer. These companies went to IPO with their stock valuations 3 or 4xing in one day, creating a feeding frenzy for greedy investors. As a result, the Nasdaq index peaked on the 10th of March 2000 at 5,048, nearly doubling in value in just one year. The dot-com mania was so intense that even leading high-tech companies such as Dell and Cisco actually placed huge sell orders on their own stocks when the market peaked, sparking panic selling amongst investors. And thus, as investment capital began to dry up, so did the lifeblood of the now cash-strapped dot-com companies. Companies that had reached market capitalizations in the hundreds of millions of dollars with no minimum viable product to show for it became absolutely worthless within the space of a few months. And by the end of 2001, as the majority of dot-com companies folded, the trillions of dollars that had been poured into the bubble all of a sudden evaporated forever. Last on our list, the mighty US housing bubble. This was a real estate bubble affecting over half of the states in the US, and it was the impetus for the subprime mortgage crisis. Now, some analysts believe that the bursting of the Nasdaq dot-com bubble led to US investors piling into real estate in the oft-mistaken belief that real estate is a safer asset class. But as we're about to see, this isn't always the case. The seeds of this US-based real estate bubble were planted during the years of rock-bottom interest rates and loose lending standards in the mid-2000s. As usual, it all began with good intentions. Faced with the bursting of the dot-com bubble, a series of corporate accounting scandals and the attacks of 9-11, the Federal Reserve lowered the federal fund's interest rate from 6.5% in May 2000 to 1% in June 2003. The aim was to boost the economy by making money available to businesses and consumers at bargain rates. Now, the result of this was an upward spiral in home prices as borrowers took advantage of the low mortgage rates. Even subprime borrowers, i.e. those with poor or no credit history, were able to realise the dream of buying a home. The mortgage providers then sold these loans to Wall Street banks, which packaged them into what were billed as low-risk financial instruments such as mortgage-backed securities and collateralised debt obligations, or CDOs. And in no time at all, a big secondary market for originating and distributing subprime loans emerged. Now, I don't intend to dive too deep into subprimes and CDOs. I recommend watching The Big Short, though, for an entertaining and educational look at how the US housing bubble developed and collapsed. Anyways, given the low interest rates, greater appetite for risk grew among the greedy big banks. This is because the SEC relaxed the net capital requirements in October of 2004 for Goldman Sachs, Merrill Lynch, Lehman Brothers, Bear Stearns, and Morgan Stanley. This capital requirement relaxation ultimately freed up big banks to leverage their initial investments by up to 30 or even 40 times. But eventually, interest rates started to rise and home ownership reached saturation point. The Fed started raising rates in June 2004, and two years later, the federal funds rate had reached 5.25%, where it remained until August 2007. Now, this caused real distress for many Americans. All of a sudden, they were left with homes that were worth less than what they had initially paid or were still paying for. Ultimately, they couldn't sell their homes without owing money to their lenders. If they had adjustable rate mortgages, their costs were going up as the values of their homes were going down. The most vulnerable subprime borrowers were stuck with mortgages they couldn't afford in the first place. It thus became apparent by August 2007 that the financial markets could not solve the subprime crisis and the problems were reverberating well beyond US borders. The interbank market that had kept money moving around the globe froze completely, largely due to fear of the unknown. And in October 2007, the Swiss bank UBS became the first major bank to announce a loss of $3.4 billion from subprime-related investments. But by the summer of 2008, the carnage was spreading across the financial sector, and the collapse of the venerable Wall Street bank Lehman Brothers in September marked the largest bankruptcy in US history. 
For many, it became a symbol of the devastation caused by the global financial crisis. That same month, financial markets were in freefall, with the major US indexes suffering some of their worst losses on record. Big banks aside, which were mainly responsible for the entire bubble in the first place, by the way, the economic damage and human suffering was immense. Unemployment reached a whopping 10%, with about 3.8 million Americans losing their homes to foreclosures. This truly changed banking and financial history forever, and the effects of it are still with us to this day. And that's it for most of my video on the top five asset bubbles in history, folks. I hope it was an interesting watch, and I hope you learned something new today. Although every bubble that's occurred in history has had its differences, unique characteristics, and causes, one common denominator of most bubbles is the willingness of participants to suspend disbelief and ignore the increasing number of cautionary signs and red flags. Another point that needs mentioning is that the bigger the disbelief, and therefore the bigger the bubble, the greater the damage it inflicts whenever it does, and it always does, burst. Be it the Dutch tulip mania, the South Sea Company, Japan's real estate, the dot-com saga, or the US housing crisis, or any other bubble, each and every one of these instances of overvaluation carries a sobering lesson for all of us. So, take heed. And that concludes today's video, folks. I hope you enjoyed it, but I'd love to hear your feedback. So what do you think about these bubbles? Are there others brewing as we speak? Let me know in the comments below. Remember to subscribe to the channel and ping that notification bell if you'd like to keep getting the highest quality crypto content on the scene. Make sure you also check out the Coin Bureau Clips channel to get all the information you need on emergency crypto market moves. I'll see you very soon, but until then, I can be found on TikTok, Telegram, Instagram, and Twitter. Subscribing to my weekly newsletter will make your crypto life supremely better. It's packed with all the tips and tricks that will make your gains stick. You may also want to check out my deals page. It's got some of the best crypto deals and promos on the market today. So thank you so much for watching, folks, and I'll see you all very soon. This is Guy bidding you goodbye. Thank <laughs> you.